what I'll do is just introduce uh, how, how I came to do what I was doing. And really, this is a practical guide. I've been to these meetings before, and it's just really useful um, given the parlous state of, of paid newspapers, journalism, to, you know, to help you guys out and, 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 and some practical solution rather than me expatiating at length about my completely eclectic career. Uh, which, is, which is Darwinian in its essence, is that it's a series of successful accidents, or, or sometimes completely unsuccessful accidents. Um, I'll get to how, I'll just tell you briefly about how I ended up doing you know, crowdfunding stuff and becoming a journalist. Um, so I did my career in reverse. Most people start as journalists, you know, quite a novel, and they become a screenwriter, and I've got it completely the wrong way around. Uh, and actually rather love it compared to uh, writing fiction. I mean, I think you guys, I mean, I've always admired journalists, and I was 16 and having a rough time at school, and I read For Whom the Bell Tolls, and I wanted to be a journalist to go to Spain and the Civil War and make the earth move for someone. Um, but, but you guys do make the earth move. I mean, I, I, you know, my experience of, um, you know, brief experience, only two or three years, really, of, of journalism proper, has been profoundly social, very, you know, and journalists are the smartest people I've met. I mean, I've met a lot of people actors, you know, publishers, radio directors, all kinds of people, and journalists are really some of the smartest and nicest people I've met, despite the problems in their industry. I won't go on about uh, phone hacking or the other related subjects. I mean, I don't think that bit is over. And I think, particularly for me, the Daniel Morgan panel inquiry, independent panel inquiry, will, will reveal more. But let me skirt all the dark side, the dark arts, and go straight to... Um, Crowdfunding. So, uh, I suppose, I suppose what happened basically is the television is a similar part of state in some ways. British television was ten years ago um, to uh, journalism. It got very top-heavy. A lot of management, not a lot of revenues. BBC cards, advertising revenues going down. And I always knew I couldn't quite rely on that career. Always interested by journalists. Had written non-fiction books for favour and favour. Uh, and features, you know, some light features, but always trying to do dramas, I went undercover in Humberside, three days with cops, on following this drug deal that was brilliant, and on the Hems helicopter when I did the show called Red, so I, I loved getting out there and doing uh, journalism search. So, and this is the very interesting how I became, I was basically a frustrated journalist and blogger, and I think it was around the Obama campaign, my son worked on and I got very interested. I knew some of, them, some of the people in the campaign and started blogging about it for this site, Daily Cops. Now, this is very interesting because it kind of leads us to this model which is happening now uh, with Biden. So, Daily Cops is uh, a, a, a very, it's kind of left wing. It's a bit left wing. It's liberal. Well, American left wing isn't that left wing, in fact. <laughs> you know, Obama could be a conservative, but um, in the British terms, um, supports, you know, you know, it's communist to support public, uh, publicly funded health in America. So, it's not really that left wing. But it has like 14 million visitors a week. And what you do is you write, uh, what they call them diaries, but the origin of journal journalism is in journals. You write a piece, and other people comment and recommend. And as, you, as people like it, it goes up, they're called the rec list, like this on the right-hand column. And then really like it, you're on the front page. They have paid journalists there, about 10, I think, or maybe a few paid columnists. And I suddenly, I was always writing on there. I was very interested in um, the Obama campaign. And oh, just a little aside, there was this completely obscure blogger called Poblana, who in January 2008, this was just after the Iowa primaries, where you know, Hillary was going to walk in, Obama suddenly wins the Iowa primary in 2008, in January. And this guy said, Poblana, completely obscure guy, nobody knew who he was, Obama's going to win the nomination and probably the election. I'm okay, what? what? He was a sports analyst and betting analyst. And he got it completely right, and his name was Nate Silver, we discovered later. So in this obscure site, well not that obscure, in, he came up and got recommended and then became this great the guy predicted the last election in the US, much better than any pollster. So there's this crowd community source journalism. I, I started covering just briefly so I got that. Because of the pile of state of British television, I made a big career decision, which was to, because I had a slight academic side, to describe what was going wrong, and I wrote this piece in 2009 for Prospect magazine, which is the longest career suicide note in history. <laughs> Why we can't write the wire? Why Britain's drama was failing relatively in the 20 years I've worked in it compared to the US? I named names, I said that 70% of the dramas are now being commissioned by one person. 
Jane Tranter and then Ben Stevenson. Ben Stevenson called me up to his office for three hours. And I haven't worked in television drama since. I've done a lot of uh, radio drama. And my, the problem, what I was trying to disguise there, was a problem as a creative, like you guys, you know, as a writer, there's something a problem monopoly, that no matter how brilliant this one person was, that they should commit to the commission 70% of the drama, made it less of a marketplace, and more like a court. And you had to be in, and I had been in with the right baron, you know, or Earl of Essex, and he had got his head chopped off, and I suddenly had no work. Uh, and so, because I'd done this, when the phone hacking scam came on, I kind of understood about media, media monopolies and started writing about this at the daily cost. And I started writing. And I knew some that I had met Rebecca Books in 2006. I, my uh, amicably divorced ex wife was a senior journalist. She was the first woman editor of Newsnight, head of BBC World uh, content, uh, editorial content. So I knew the side of that side of journalism and felt capable to write about the phone hacking. Scandal as a monopoly, rather than the regulatory, rather than the lesson problem as a monopoly problem that happens. Uh, and it's very handy when Guido Fawkes said to me, Well, you're going after Murdoch, what about the BBC? And I go, Well, here's what I've done at the BBC, and you know, that sort of diffuses that. So I wrote these three, these articles, they're really summations of what other people were saying for an American audience. <laughs> they got recommended, a publisher approached me to write a book, and one of the, the, the happiest moments was. Uh, I was writing this book uh, called Four Nights of Murdoch, and I stand by it, the house, the dynasty, Fall from Grace. Um, uh, I still stand by that title. But I wrote the introduction about the importance of journalism. And I remember when I was about um, 14, so also my, my dad was a Scientologist, and he was bankrupted for the third time. And we were living in a council estate at the mental hospital. My parents had separated. And I was really going off the rails. I was sort of kept on getting suspended from school. Uh, oh, all sorts of things. And obvious emotional reasons, but in, my mum was still there. She's an Armenian refugee's daughter. She had sort of quite adopted by an English family, quite a, law, a lawyer in the and East Anglia, was quite posh. And so she still got the Sunday Times. And every Sunday, the Sunday Times would come through, and I was 14, I, I loved drawing, I'd copy pictures of it, and then I'd start <laughs> reading it. And then I thought, I really want to be, you know, this is great, this is Harry Evans's. Sunday Times. And actually, I, I, so I did end up doing a write, got to Cambridge, and was in the Sunday Times for a drama thing I did. So Harry Evans was my hero in the importance of journalism. Halfway through the book, I got contacted by Daily Beast, uh, the foreign affairs editor of Louisa Rue, who said, can we see, okay, that's Harry Evans, he didn't know he was in it, would like to see a copy of your manuscript. And I sent it to him, it was very helpful, and the Daily Beast employed me as a kind of London correspondent. So I had about two years, about 100 articles, not just Tony Mackey, Levison, but also Savile, um, Libor a bit, and some other things. And Google, and the, the problems of monopoly of Google. So, I was just going to the phone hacking trial in October 2013, so uh, to update my book. Because I'd done this full house murder, I thought, now we have the evidence. And I don't know why I started live tweeting. Um, a lot of pre-trial hearings. I met Martin there. He was in Blobber's Corner with me and another court reporter, James Dolman. And, and maybe because of my drama background, and just because I wanted a record of it, uh, I decided to tweet everything I possibly could. Uh, that was during the opening. There's, I, any court reporter here will know the opening tends to be written, uh, and uh, so therefore is less problematic in terms of content. The hacking trial had years pre-trial. It was the most kind of contempt-covered trial in history in that all the defendants, most notably Rebecca Brooks and Lenny Coulson, were saying, we cannot get a fair trial because of the prejudicial <coughs> media coverage, which is slightly <coughs> ironic, given the senior <laughs> media figures. And so they were very wary, and the judge was very wary about, you know, they had a private eye, front page, Rebecca Brooks, some Halloween reference, which, you know, lawyers don't, my lord, how can she possibly get a fair trial with this prejudicial comment? All the lawyers were all over Twitter. And I just thought, well, they went, ah, you just like to read the whole thing. You know, I didn't even think about it. I'll be there at the opening, have the evidence, type it out, I'll have a record of it. I was supposed to be doing pieces for the Daily Beast, but they since sold Newsweek, they couldn't give me a retainer. So I, in a way, I was 
live tweeting to my editor there so they could see what stories were coming up. Um, and I said, maybe because I'm quite fast typist or a dramatic ear or something like that, that I was, you know, people just started, my followers, I don't know, to 2,000. So they zoomed up to 12. Uh, I was told by Tom Watson, everybody was watching in Parliament. Later by the police, they didn't bother to come in, they just followed my feed. Uh, and they just stayed in their, 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 the base in Putney. Uh, and the weirdest thing of all was coming into the trial. Eventually, I was in the annex, you needed a ticket, because it wasn't like this, because uh, so many press one who had 10, only 12 could be in the court itself. They had screens and sound, which worked intermittently. The great thing is you could see the emails and evidence more clearly, so I could type out the dates. I really wanted a record of dates of everything. Uh, and you could talk. <laughs> So in the court, you can't say anything to anybody else because everybody's there. But, but you know, we could joke and josh around and ask each other questions. But the building was built opposite a bit like this. My phone reception went in the last half. I had to tweet from the court itself, which is very odd because everybody's on their laptops, including the defendants. So Charlie was watching horse racing, so he says, uh, and watching my tweets. It's a very strange experience when they go, oh, have I got that right? Because they're just seeing it. But anyway, I was only going to do the opening. And I was completely, I was also three days, God knows how many tweets, every bit of evidence. The opening, one of my great moments of pride, this is really stupid and venal, was that I met Nick Davis during the run-up and he told me back getting a ticket. And everybody knew about the books course and affair for like six months. Everybody who'd been to the pre-trials or had connections with people in the law. But we didn't know when it was going to come out. And so we're looking at the opening, and, and Edis, Andrew Edis, the prosecutor, wouldn't stick to the opening. It was very much, you know, as a report against delivery, because it'd veer off. And I could suddenly see it coming and go, breaking, course that I've books, I've had a fair for three years or something like that, and wished it out, and I beat Nick Davis by 20 seconds. <laughs> so I must have a tabloid heart somewhere. Anyway, that was over. I was completely exhausted. My whining table went up, because it was quite stressful people you know would always be checking you mostly helpfully by the way this thing about interactive media when we discuss you know crowdfunding and all this stuff is that the crowd and 90 percent of the time help they will check fact check you they will help you with spellings they will correct you in a friendly way uh, but there were some unfriendly people as I documented um, so I thought phew that's over now I can go back to my uh, whatever my life is uh, and then the judge, Mr. Justice Saunders, said, I, I decided we can live tweet the whole trial. And everybody, including some, maybe slightly uh, antagonistic personalities like Harry Coles on the, on the Gideon Fawkes blog, said, well, you better be there for the duration now. I thought, well, bloody hell, how am I going to do this? I mean, I'm going to be lucky because the American interest wasn't that huge to sell two articles a week to maybe the so that's, if I'm lucky, $500. I'd be lucky to get one a week after one. How am I going to? I just can't do this. Um, so I went back home that night and wrote a slightly self pitying blog, saying, I'm sorry, guys, uh, I can't do this. I can't afford that. I missed the first time in my life, I missed the mortgage payment, which I had. Uh, mainly because the other you know, books and journalism isn't that well paying on its own. But I did notice at the end of this blog, I said, uh, Oh, uh, and somebody sent me 10 quid just by my email address through PayPal. I didn't know at that point you could do that. I just found 10 quid in my account, so I emailed it because they like my coverage. And I said, well, you know, maybe if other people were interested. <laughs> and I woke up the next morning, uh, people suggested, go and crowdfund it, like not hundreds, but dozens of people said, go on, go on, Jukes, crowdfund it. I had crowdfunded the novel, for uh, that's my novel, through the site Unbound, a publishing site, which you get pre-purchases through. So I knew about that. Fortunately, I'd just been on television on CNN, so I had a video which was helps with crowdfunding. So I could bung that up, me and Emily Bell, and this guy, guy did full complete. And I went, oh, okay, how much should I ask for? You always, this is slightly contradictory to what you're told here. I thought, I've had a pitch low, some people, I'll just ask for 4,000 pounds to cover me in the next two months, so that's uh, 2,000 pounds a month. Uh, and, and I didn't want the embarrassment to go on go on too long. So I said, well, I'll, put, I'll give it six days. So, and then I left the internet alone for an hour, or two hours, which was unlike me. I'm all over the internet. Um, 
And then I came back and it was fully funded, and it overshot in a day to six grand. I did that. Then I had to engage with the audience. You are owned by your audience. They are your employees. You answer all their questions, except the contemptuous ones. You have to engage with them a lot, which is pleasurable, I can tell you, because they pay me money. And they, you know, they're good. Basically, you know, the crowdfunders are very good. You get a couple of arsey people, but anyway, you get a couple of arsey people. And then I refunded again. Uh, so that seemed to work. Everybody liked my coverage. It got a bit dull, but still people. And so I think, well, I'll cover the end of the trial. It was supposed to be over by Christmas, by the way, at one point. But it was also going to go on deep into the summer until June. So in January again, I did a bit of market search. People liked, you do these surveys very easily online. Uh, there's MailChimp for mailing and SurveyMonkey. Right? It's very easy once you've got the email addresses to find out what your audience like. Did they want any change of coverage? I had a set rewards like, um, you know, five pound thank you. I forget the exact, but you can see them grading 25 pounds, you're part of my weekly newsletter, 100 pounds, you can do a launch party, have dinner with me, 200 pounds, I promise not to have dinner with you. Um, <laughs> and actually, you know, a few people took a lot of, like, they loved the launch party. So I funded it again another 14, I asked for, I forget, I've got my number. Anyway, I asked for a certain amount, like 12, to fund me to the end of the trial. Overshot that, it took longer to fund it, it was, it was you know, rather than a day, it took a week or two. Um, but it's still got um, fully funded. And then, that's where Martin comes in, about in May, we thought, well, we have all these followers and this database of names of people who are interested in this, what about a book? And we basically came up with a book proposal and another level of pledges and fundings, like free VIP tickets come to launch, all those things, which is a, a brilliant way of publishing, because you know who your audience are. You really have pre audio print one without a huge but I could talk more, a bit, bit more about it. And so you see, it went from books to journalism to books, live tweets, all this kind of this convergence of what people uh, need. But I'm going to take questions and we'll get some questions and we'll go more generally. Martin can take over. But uh, the key thing <coughs> is it's a relationship now between you and your readers. The editor is irrelevant. I mean, you might need the editorial help. They'll edit. They'll, I mean, people, they, I crowdsource to copy editing and proofreading of the book. Most of it done for free, doesn't it? I mean, just people on the internet love to help.